Good, we're here for the webinar on designing resilient and sustainable laboratories today. I will wait a couple of seconds for our attendees to arrive before we officially start the session. So welcome everyone to our webinar today on designing resilient and sustainable laboratories. My name is Dorina Nati. I am an associate industrial development expert at the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and I will be moderating today's session. Um, however, I'm just, I'm just the moderator. Our discussion today will be led by our honorable speakers, Mr. Rajendra Kumar Patel, Mr. Jian Yu Huang, and Ms. Catherine Lubineau. Um, the session today will consist of two presentations, one by Mr. Patel and one by Mr. Huang and Ms. Lubino. Um, as participants, you are encouraged to pose your questions in writing in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will do our best to answer your questions after our presentations today, and we would like to apologize in advance if time does not allow to answer all your questions. Um, today's topic is of particular interest to all of us, and especially UNIDO. UNIDO has a long history in supporting laboratories worldwide to increase their capacities in the laboratories, but also to uh, enable a favorable environment around quality infrastructure in general. Over the past uh, 20 years, UNIDO has supported more than 1,000 conformity assessment bodies in 58 countries, including in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. Um, recently, UNIDO has launched a guidance document on the implementation of ISO IEC 17025, 2017 version, um, tested and accepted. And is, UNIDO is at the same time accompanying laboratories worldwide in their journey towards accreditation. Uh, as UNIDO, we put special emphasis on linking the services provided by uh, the conformity assessment bodies and laboratories to the market and to the demand of the market. Um, we have an interactive online platform where we have a number of tools such as the laboratory network, which provides information about laboratory services worldwide. Um, UNIDO is further working to enhance institutional and regulatory environment around quality infrastructure um, and has developed a thorough guidance on the development of quality policy. Um, currently, we're working on uh, providing more specific guidance on the development of laboratory policy to help countries establish and maintain an effective laboratory infrastructure. Um, but today, we want to look inside the laboratory to better understand how we can improve an effective laboratory design in view of sustainability. You can find information about UNIDO's uh, work in the area of quality and standards, but also all of UNIDO's tool on our Knowledge Hub. Um, please visit hub.unido.org. Uh, and having said that, and without further ado, I would like to hand the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Rajendra Kumar Patel. Mr. Patel is a laboratory infrastructure specialist. He's a fellow of the Royal Societies of Biology and Chemistry and a visiting research fellow at King's College London. Mr. Patel has been assisting many countries to plan and develop laboratory infrastructure to strengthen the re their regulatory framework, including providing advice and recommendations on laboratory design, equipment, specifications, procurement, delivery, conditions, and maintenance. Mr. Patel, the floor is yours. You may now share your screen Thank you, Dorina. for your presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? I don't think so, Mr. Patel. Maybe you can try one more time. Yes. Look okay, great. Now. We can see your screen. Okay, welcome everybody to this meeting. I think in terms of developing a resilient laboratory, First thing I would say is that the problems are international, they're global. All countries developed, emerging economies and 
developing countries, we all face similar problems. We all know that laboratories are critical for a sustainable economy and they support many, many different sectors of the, of the economy. I think one good example, apart from the ones that I have already listed in, on this slide, is we all pay taxes. We pay tax for the beer we drink, we pay tax for the fuel we use in our cars, and even those need to be monitored in laboratories and underpinned by laboratories. In terms of its in impact on, on, on the economy, there's a massive market for, for laboratories. And I'm, I've just quoted one example here. In the United States, for example, in the year 2019, clinical laboratories, just clinical laboratories supporting health services contributed $106 billion in total economic out output. And they supported over 688,000 jobs, generating $44 billion in wages and paying more than $14 billion in, in taxes. So the laboratories are really the backbone of economic activity. And in my mind, laboratories provide locations for scientists like me, engineers, researchers to address and provide innovative solutions to our greatest challenges, including health, well-being, food security, poverty reduction, climate change, and when it comes to addressing climate change, I think all of us in the scientific community have, been, have for long been very, very open and vocal and forthright about the importance of urgent action. However, when we look at laboratory facilities and practices that we have been using, I think the vision is not always reflected. There's room for a lot of improvement by putting sustainability at the heart of scientific activities. And designing laboratory facilities and practices that are more efficient and cost-effective, thus making better use of resources with minimal environmental impact. So I thought I would give you one or two examples because we don't have much time. And the one example that comes to my mind straight away is every laboratory will have a fume cupboard. Some large laboratories will have tens and hundreds of fume cupboards. And they are very, very energy intensive. They use five to 10 times more energy than an academic or an office space. A fume hood would use, of one single fume hood would use about 3.5 times more energy than an average house. Here I'm referring to an American household. So, you know, they use a large amount of energy and obviously have, have an impact on climate and environment. Some of the new designs can reduce the energy input. And if you do that, you also have less demand on your heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, resulting in substantial savings. However, one of the problems is many national standards and regulations stipulate absolute airflows rather than flow rates required for containment and safety making it difficult to introduce some of these more efficient technologies. So in my mind, it's very clear, international standards on such issues would have a significant impact, especially for smaller laboratories in developing countries. Another example I can give is all laboratories will have freezers. And if you look at ultra low temperature freezers, like the ones at minus 80, they will consume as much electricity in a year as, it, as an average UK household. So one freezer, one UK household. By replacing these freezers with new energy efficient freezers and reducing the temperature just by 10 degrees to 70 degrees centigrade will result in significant savings. So we need to look at our practices, we need to look at our standard operating procedures and, and See, do we really need a freezer at minus 80? Can we not use it at minus 70? And, and I've given some data here on this slide from studies done at the University of Cambridge, which show that if you buy a new freezer, you reduce your energy consumption by 55%, your cost by 55%, and if you use, reduce the temperature, it's 67%. 
So key issues, laboratories are huge consumers of plastic as well, and we need to think about that. And I'm aware that we are, you know, I'm running over my time, so I'm going to kind of skip just appeal, use less, less plastics. So in conclusion, with a significant impact and the growing climate emergency, laboratory design must take sustainability issues into account. And in this regard, internationally agreed laboratory design standards will make a huge contribution. And my colleagues, Jian Yu and Catherine, will talk about international standards on laboratory design. Back to you, Dorina. Thank you very much. Mr. Patel, this was a very interesting insight. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to proceed and uh, give the floor to Mr. Jiang Yu Huang and Ms. Catherine Lubeno. Mr. Huang is a laboratory design specialist and a professor of Tsinghua University since 2005, with 12 years of experience in laboratory design. Mr. Huang is an expert of the Working Group on Laboratory Design, Construction and Accreditation, and a member of the Laboratory Instrument and Equipment Standardization Technical Committee in China. Um, Ms. Catherine Lubeno has been working in the field of standardization for more than 25 years as a committee manager at the European and international levels. Since 2013, Ms. Lubeno has been serving as the technical manager of the Sectoral Standardization Office of the French Standardization System in the field of mechan mechanical engineering and rubber industries, operating on behalf of AFNOR, the French National Organization for Standardization. Um, thank you very much for, to all of you for being here with us today. And I'd like to hand the floor to um, Ms. Lubeno and Mr. Huang. Mr. Huang, I don't think uh, we can hear you. We can see this, the slides. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Nalati. Mm, thank you. Thanks for your introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar. Uh, today, I'm presenting to you the proposal from Standard Administration China to uh, form a new technical committee for laboratory design, ISO TSP 290. There has been close cooperation between China and France uh, in developing this uh, initiative. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Catherine uh, will make the presentation together with me. The presentation consists of uh, eight parts. First, <coughs> necessity. <coughs> Why are laboratory design standards important? Second, purpose and benefits. Third, ISO TSP 280, April uh, 2019. Outcome, comments, <coughs> and uh, suggestion received. Fourth, ISO TSP 290 laboratory design proposal made uh, 2020 uh, scope and within a key points addressed in ISO TSP 290. Fifth, a relation with national regulations and standards. The sixth, international stakeholders. Seventh, cooperation between China and France. And the last one is the conclusion. 
a laboratory design standard are important for us. There is a massive glo global market and uh, demand for efficient, sustainable, and uh, cost-effective laboratories. Here are a few examples. Undoubtedly, the worldwide market benefiting from laboratory design, ISO TSP 290, will be massive. Laboratory are a complex system involving. Catherine, thank you. Okay, thank you. A laboratory are a complex system involving. Uh, it's VAC, water supply and uh, drainage, uh, electricity, auto uh, control, decoration, workbenches, uh, firm holds, safety showers, biological safety cabinets, etc. And uh, demand a high quality specialized design for laboratory environment, health and safety. Furthermore, uh, please, uh, Catherine, next slide. Thank you. Hi, Catherine. Next slide, please. Next. Yes, correctly, thank you. Uh, furthermore, there is also a rising demand for smart laboratory utilize digital technologies, for example, big data, uh, AI, cloud computing, blockchain, etc., for better laboratory management and environmental control. However, currently there, there are no laboratory design standards at ISO level. Next, Catherine, thank you. The primary objective of purpose of our laboratory design proposal, ISO TSP 290, is uh, to provide unified global standards for laboratory design and design effective system to meet all the environment, uh, health, and safety activities of the laboratory, avoiding accidents and uh, protecting the well-being of all those uh, working in the uh, laboratory, and uh, to stipulate technical requirements for smart laboratories, standards for application to, uh, for digital uh, technology to ensure safety, effectiveness and the stability of the laboratory environment. Laboratory design TC will bring a lot of benefits for laboratory owners. It can help construction cost control, investment risk, uh, risk uh, reduction, project quality evaluation for laboratory designers, it can promote design more scientifically. It can be important base, basis for building scientific laboratory. For laboratory constructors, it can help construction quality improvement, technological advancement, and more regulated industry. For laboratory users, it can spawn more scientific and uh, regulated laboratory usage and uh, more values added by smart laboratories. For laboratory operators, it can bring easier operation and uh, maintenance. For the society, it can help cultivate more talents, sustainable development of for the industry and the society, inspire the creativity of researchers and uh, promote technological advancement. 
Now I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Ms. Catherine Lobino. Hi, Catherine. Catherine, I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So thank you uh, very much, Janu, for, for this uh, beginning of presentation. So as uh, uh, Janu said uh, in, in his presentation, a cooperation between China and France uh, is forcing at the committee level for this uh, new uh, international committee and um, this collaboration will be based on three uh, three main aspects so the first one is the day-to-day -day assistance to, to the secretary um, we, the, the idea is to take benefit from the experience from as now UNM as committee manager so we are in charge of already 17 ISO technical committees or subcommittees and 29 working groups. So uh, voilà, that's the idea to, to share uh, the, the, this, uh, this information. Uh, second item is uh, concerned the integration of new rules. Uh, the standardization activities is um, stable, but uh, rules uh, always evolve. Um, and uh, uh, it's important to always have in mind what are the new items to to implement them for for the committee on laboratory design so uh, uh, we would like to uh, to use uh, the information that we get as manager of committee already to to be shared with the, the technical committee manager and uh, as a third point uh, we will uh, help in the preparation of meetings, uh, so the, the preparation of the agenda, but uh, also uh, uh, helping in the writing of the resolutions and uh, all the activity uh, around the meetings themselves. Um, this uh, first proposal was submitted at the international level last year and uh, the, the member bodies were asked uh, if they support the establishment of such a new technical committee and if they intended to participate actively. Uh, with this first ballot, we received uh, 15 uh, countries voted in favor, five were against and 15 abstained. So you see those country on, on those country on this screen and uh, in order to be created a technical committee uh, needs two uh, criteria the first one is two-thirds of the ISO member bodies in favor of the creation of the committee and the second one is um, the uh, the, the the answer from member bodies, uh, from five member bodies, saying that they want to participate actively to the committee. You probably know that for an international committee, uh, the countries have three possibilities. Either they want to be a real participants, or they can decide to be only observers in the committee, or they can decide to not take part at all and not receive any document. So, it's a, a necessity to have at least five countries um, ready to participate actively to the committee. So last year we received seven uh, ballots uh, who wanted to participate, but only four were counted um, because Germany, Japan did not support the proposal and UK abstained. So we had uh, the, the, the commitment from China, Finland, Republic of Korea and France. Um, so, during the voting process, um, we received many useful comments at that time and valuable suggestions, um, and mainly most of those comments concern potential overlaps with other technical committees, because uh, we will see uh, in, in the presentation that already several committees worked on, on some part of use of laboratories and uh, 
uh, there were questions to what, what will be the aim of this new committee that we wanted to create. And uh, subsequently, we received a number of uh, comments from member bodies saying that uh, they wanted to actively participate also, but the ballot was closed. Uh, therefore, we decided to resubmit a new proposal to ISO. So, this new proposal has a new scope in order to clarify the link with uh, other existing technical committees. So, this new scope uh, reads as follows. So, laboratory design, including site selection, design of internal layout of space and services, and the objective is to provide functional, safe, uh, energy efficient and sustainable laboratories, taking into account, of course, environmental impact and the practical division of experimental and support areas and layout plus model selection of laboratory furniture. And uh, the aim also was to incorporate, integrate the standardization of apparatus and devices for personal safety aspects that are an integral part of the laboratory. So that's a very important uh, aspect of the committee is uh, that uh, all the aspects concerning safety, uh, which are not integral part of the laboratory, but concerning the use and, and the people uh, in the laboratories themselves are not uh, covered by, by the committee and because they are already covered by other committees. So, um, and in the exclusion, we had ISO TC48 for laboratory equipment, uh, the technical committee dealing with clinical laboratory testing and in vitro diagno diagnostic test systems, the TASCO IECTC 66 on safety of measuring and uh, laboratory equipment, and ISO TC209 on clean rooms. So, and this proposed technical committee will not pursue subjects within the scope of other TCs included, but not limited to those listed above. So, uh, as a synthesis, we can say that uh, this technical committee will deal with standardization of various types of laboratory design, so the siting and planning, the functional division of experimental areas, the determination of scientific and technological processes, the layout and furniture design, and the scientific design of the facility by taking environmental conditions and impact uh, into account. So I told you that uh, during the first ballot, we received several comments from several countries concerning potential overlap uh, with other committees and, and also uh, major, uh, very uh, fruitful comments. Um, the first one being the relevance of an international laboratory design standard to national interests of all countries. Um, other comments on the link with ISO IEC 17025 and uh, ISO 15199 uh, about competence of testing and calibration laboratories, uh, the, the 15189 being dedicated to medical laboratories. Um, the link with ISO TC48. Uh, the one with ISO TC 209 and the one with ISO TC 136. So I will show you in the next slide uh, the way we see the collaboration between those committees. Concerning the link uh, with ISO 17125 and uh, sorry, 17025, sorry, and ISO 15189, uh, we can read in these two documents uh, requirement, general requirements. Uh, uh, concerning the, the, the laboratory itself. It's written that uh, we have to identify that robust and quality outputs from laboratory uh, design um, depend on their facilities and environmental conditions. But those documents do not provide any guidance on laboratory design. So it's a very general uh, requirement without giving uh, any detail. So, uh, the idea of the new proposal is to provide technical requirements to support these requirements that we can find in those two standards. 
Now concerning the link with ISO TC48 on laboratory uh, equipment, um, we can see that the stakeholders and scope and global market size uh, for uh, ISO TC48 and the new technical committee are very, very uh, fundamentally different. Um, ISO TC48 deals with specification for small laboratory equipment such as glass, plasticware, thermometers, barrett and automated liquid and, and microfluidic dispensers. We have laboratory design uh, committee will focus on design of the laboratory itself, so covering electrical, water, drainage, uh, heating and, and, and ventilation and air conditioning, fire prevention, together with the earthworm control system integrating all these functions. So we can see that it's very, very uh, different uh, subjects. Uh, ISO TC48 standards are dedicated to the producers and users of laboratory equipment, whereas the stakeholders for the new TC uh, are, are more uh, uh, the laboratory owners, so including the government, scientific agencies and enterprises, and the operators, designers, constructors, and professional scientific and technological users. We can uh, here give a, a small uh, example that is a little bit uh, easy, but uh, it gives uh, a good idea. So the difference between this new TC and TC48 is like the manufacturing uh, standard for a television uh, versus the standard for exterior and interior design of a building. Of course, they require very different professional skills. And also the TV is in the house. The rules for building the TV cannot be applied to designing the house. So it's really uh, to, to, to show you the, the, uh, the, the, the complementarity between those two activities. So TC48 activities only pertain to devices and apparatus and are not going to change or ameliorate environmental sustainability or laboratory health and safety. However, uh, the new TC could deal with all of these uh, underlying issues. Um, now concerning the link with ISO TC 209 that deals with clean rooms, of course, most labora laboratories uh, do not include clean rooms. So uh, for those one, there is this technical committee does not uh, elaborate uh, anything. However, for the laboratories that do, the new TC um, uh, will have to refer to the standards developed by ISO TC 209. Uh, there is no intention at all to, uh, to, to, to copy or to develop new requirements which would be in contradiction with the one of TC 209. The intention is really uh, to, uh, uh, to take those standards and to refer to them and, and to complete for the, for the laboratories which do not include clean rooms and the part not dealing with the clean room aspects. Um, ISO TC136 is also uh, an interesting committee for this new activity. It deals with furniture and uh, once again uh, the, the new TC will conform or refer to the standards from this committee. But uh, here it will focus on the selection of furniture that, that we can use uh, in a laboratory and we will provide specific requirements for laboratory furniture. For example, there are special needs in laboratories for chemical resistance, for ability to decontaminate, for mechanical resistance, electrostatic properties, etc. So this TC will provide the complementary information uh, concerning those uh, requirements and characteristics. So, can you, I let you the, the floor. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Maybe I have to skip some slides for the time, for the short time. So uh, this slide is, uh, is for what's the relation with national regulations and standards. 
And uh, the, the next uh, slide, please, Catherine. About uh, international stakeholders, uh, we think the ISO TSP290 is of significance to national interests of all countries. And uh, the next, uh, please. And the next, yes, next, please. Catherine, please. Uh, ISO uh, TSP uh, 290 should enable countries to address a wide the range of global issues and reach uh, uh, UN sustainable development goals in particularly first no <clears throat> poverty, the second zero hunger, three uh, third <clears throat> good health and well being, the sixth clean. Uh, next, uh, please, Catherine. Next slide, please. Okay, correctly. The uh, six uh, clean water and uh, uh, sanitation, the seventh affordable uh, and the clean energy, and the eighth uh, decent work and and economic growth, the uh, third climate action, and the seventh partnership to achieve a goal and inclusion. Once ISO TSP 290 is uh, established, <coughs> licensed with uh, all uh, relevant ISO technical committee will be established, including ISO TC 48, ISO TC 212, and ISO CASCO. With TSP 290, we will have a complete set of tools for laboratories, ISO TC 22 and ISO IEC. Uh, uh, 17025 focus on laboratory capabilities. ISO TC40 focus on uh, laboratory device and uh, <coughs> apparatus, and uh, TSP290 uh, uh, focusing on laboratory design. And uh, we made a video to help you understand the value of uh, laboratory design. Please watch it. Uh, let me uh, share my uh, screen. Laboratories are the backbone of many sectors of the economy. Manufacturing, construction. Sorry, can you see my screen? Can you see the video? Yes, we can see the video. Pharmaceutical, okay, energy, agricultural and food, water and air quality and environment. Sustainable, efficient and safe laboratories benefit from ISO standards. With the current standards, TC48 provides specifications for small laboratory equipment crucial to generate quality data with appropriate accuracy and precision. ISO 17025 and ISO 15189 ensures generation of reliable results and recognizes that to do so, laboratories depend on their facilities and environmental conditions. However, they do not provide any direction on design of laboratory facilities, environment, and safety, where misplacement of fixture might lead to accidents and pollution over time. Laboratory Design TSP290 will fill this gap by encouraging detailed planning at all stages of the design process, which will include assigning a project leader and team, assessing needs and usage, and determining functionality requirements, space availability, furnishing design, and user training, while simultaneously considering future needs. In the future, a complete set of tools for laboratories will be available, with TC212, ISO 17025, and ISO 15189 focusing on on laboratory capabilities, TC48 focusing on laboratory devices and apparatus, and finally TSP290 focusing on laboratory design. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our uh, distinguished speakers. Certainly a very interesting insight into the topic of laboratory design. 
Um, we have in the meanwhile received a number of questions from the audience um, and I'd like to address the first one to Mr. Patel. So Mr. Patel, you mentioned uh, that in the future we will have to uh, avoid using disposable plastic in the laboratories. So what would be the alternative? Is there already an alternative and how does the future look like? I think that's a, that was a very good question because at the moment laboratories produce something like 2% of the total plastic waste in the world, which is a huge amount. And we don't have a discussion about it. So it's time we start thinking, it's time we start talking. And I certainly have some ideas as to what we can do, but I think we, we need to discuss. We cannot continue producing this waste. In my own laboratory, we used to do things where possible we, I think many of you may be working in laboratories and we have falcon tubes and things like that where necessary, where they, where they were not critical, we were actually washing them. Yeah. And I think, I think industry has a role to play now. There are ways that they can produce washing machines maybe, they can, yeah. So we need, we need a discussion about this. Certainly, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Patel, in times of climate change. Um, we all need to do our part in reducing our yeah, environmental... Sustainable, sustainable laboratories have to play a role. Certainly, certainly. Um, uh, the next question I'd like to address uh, maybe to all panelists, but we do work a lot with developing countries and developing countries already have difficulties meeting the standards to be accredited. Um, adding an additional standard will widen the gap to achieve international recognition. So what will be the benefits for developing countries um, with a laboratory infrastructure that it's still at, in its development phase? Can I pick that one up? Please, Mr. Patel. I think, I think it's, it's, you said something there at the development stage. So if, this, if good design is addressed right at the beginning, then in the long term, you'll save costs. And I, can, I won't name, a cup, name the country, but I can give you examples. But the laboratory was built, and then when the equipment started arriving, the doors were not wide enough for the equipment to be taken in. Yep, so you get simple, simple things that need to be sorted. There was one laboratory where the fume cupboard could not be fitted because the, the fume cupboard that was ordered was the cheapest they could find and it was obviously of the wrong size. And yeah, so, so the, the standards would actually help them. Yeah. So I, I think, it, and certainly at the beginning, it would, if those things are taken into care at the design stage, then it solves a lot of problems for the future. And in my own experience, the other thing that's happened is a lot of countries emulate designs from other countries. And they don't take into account the local environmental conditions, the local infrastructure, power failures, two or three times a day. Yes, all these things need to be taken into account very carefully at the design stage. And I think an international standard or series of standards will address these things and help people not to make expensive mistakes. Over to you, Dorina. Thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Certainly, um, design is something um, to be considered at a very early stage of development. I can only agree there, and I hope we could answer uh, the question from the audience. Um, any other panelists who would like to address the, the issue of how developing countries um, can make use of this particular standard? Good. It seems that Mr. Patel answered all our questions in this regard. <laughs> can, I, can I make a comment on that? Please. I think, I think we have to remember that this is the beginning. The standards will be developed. And I'm hoping that developing countries would actually participate. Because only by talking about your problems can you begin to address them. And an international standard would, would go a long way if, in, into a successful standard by contributing contributions from the developing countries. Certainly, thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Um, we, as you need are a strong advocate to include developing countries in uh, the standards development process. So thank you very yeah, much. Yes, please. I complete what was Raj was just saying. Yes, uh, to, to, to confirm the, the fact the standards will be written by, by the countries and people who will be uh, around the table of, of the discussions and it's very important to have developing countries in order to, uh, 
to, to very well take into account uh, their needs uh, in, in such uh, documents. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Catherine, for emphasizing our points. Um, we also heard that there are a lot of general standards, like, for example, ISO IC 17025, which is a general requirements for testing and calibration laboratories. So in the future, will the laboratory design aspect be a necessary criteria of these more general standards, or will it be one additional standard um, or guidance to follow? What is the plan? I think here yeah, the plan is more um, uh, concern, concerns more um, guidelines on, on the way to uh, to design and, and manufacture a, a, a laboratory uh, instead of uh, accreditation. So here, the intention is really to, to take a laboratory as a complete system and to see the laboratory as such including all uh, its uh, uh, heating and, and air conditioning and ventilation, uh, fire protection, uh, safety aspects. So I, I see more of this committee uh, as a guide on how to, to design a laboratory that will fit to your needs more than a, a kind of accreditation uh, afterwards. The accreditation standards for laboratories already existed, the 17025. Uh, uh, here, uh, the, the idea is more to, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to have a, a laboratory that fits your needs. Good, so um, I understand correctly that this is more for guidance purposes rather than for accreditation. Dorina, can I make a comment, please? Yes. I, think Catherine, I agree with Catherine. I think we have to remember that the ISO 17025 standard says that to produce good quality data, you must have appropriate facilities. But it doesn't give you guidelines on to how to develop those appropriate facilities. And the standard a series of standards coming out of this project should go a long way to making sure that people have appropriate facilities to meet the ISO 17025 standard. Thank you, Mr. Patel. So uh, you're saying it's rather a complementary guidance to the ISO 17025 standard, um, but not necessarily part thereof. No. So, and in the development of new standards, they will be closely liaison with all appropriate standards committees, including those responsible for 17025. Good, good to know that there will be close uh, cooperation and coordination between the requirements. I'm sure this will facilitate um, the environment for laboratories trying to comply with these. Um, my next question relates to uh, the new normal. We are now in the midst of a global crisis uh, resulting from the outbreak of COVID-19. So uh, with the new normal, what, what aspects of laboratory design or laboratory processes should be prioritized? Has anything changed or is anything to be considered as a consequence of the global health crisis? Who'd like to address the question? Catherine, do you want to say anything? Maybe I can make a comment on this. Yeah, uh, the, yeah the, the intention, uh, so, so once again, it's the, um, the different countries who will decide the priorities that we really want, will want to deal uh, within this committee. It's a choice of all the partners uh, involved in this field to choose what will be their priorities. And I think that um, we submitted a, a proposal uh, last year that was rejected. Uh, the one uh, is under ballot. And of course, the context has uh, a lot evolved uh, in one year, uh, taking into account this, uh, this crisis. And it's uh, um, very important to take uh, this aspect uh, into account, for example, uh, the aspect of, of uh, um, air conditioning and so on uh, will have uh, very will be very uh, important issues. I think. 
Thank you, Catherine. A lot has changed in the past couple of months, and this needs to be taken into consideration. Mr. Patel, you had uh, something to add? I just wanted to add something to Catherine's point. I think what has happened in the last, in the new normal, we've all recognized the need for good, basic health laboratories. They have not been, there's been a huge shortage of them all over the world, not just developing countries. And in my, in my personal view, those laboratories don't need to be huge laboratories, but they have need, need to be efficient. They need to be following quality standards and they need to be safe. And standards can help do them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm already beginning to see in the market some that are, uh, they call them mobile laboratories, but they're very good. They have all the safety features. They have all the air conditioning and airflow systems in there. So I think, I think standards would help this kind of rapid development of, of health laboratories, particularly in rural, rural areas, because a sample doesn't have time to travel to a central laboratory. Yeah. So I think, I think things will change, I'm, I'm sure of that. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Um, now a lot of uh, laboratories are already accredited, are already set up and are already in place. So how can accredited laboratories assess their readiness in their own laboratory once the ISO standard on sustainable uh, laboratory design is available? Will there be a possibility for already established labs to review their own setup in view of adjustment and optimization? Miss Catherine, maybe you can take this question. Yeah, the the the, the, re, the, the reuse or renewal of of uh, uh, laboratories is also an important issue because, uh, of course, a lot of laboratories already uh, exist all over the world, and uh, so this this committee will especially. Uh, uh, deal with the design of new laboratory as the first step, I think, but afterwards, uh, the aspects concerning the, the current uh, existing laboratories may appear uh, in order to see uh, how we can remanufacture uh, a laboratory taking into account uh, uh, new, new items or environmental aspects and so on. So that's also, we see that many times now in standardization, uh, where we have a lot of activities on remanufacturing or, or um, uh, reusability of, of products. Uh, so it, it will, of course, I think, be an issue for all the partners to work on such an item. Dorina, can I? Yes, please, Mr. Patel. Gianu? If you're listening, I know GNU has a lot of experience of working on what I call refurbishment of laboratories. And I'm sure he would agree with me that the same norms, the same standards, the same safety standards, the same energy efficiency standards would apply to refurbishment of laboratories as well. And the other point I would make is this is where I think it's important for Develop big countries to actually participate in a project like this so they can, because I agree, I think a lot of them would, would be dealing with refurbishment more than, more than new. But yeah, these are discussions we need to have, I think. Thank Jen, you. Do you want to add anything to that? Or have I said everything? Yes, uh, I agree with you a lot. Uh, I think uh, laboratory is uh, more important in the, uh, the society and the economy. Uh, in most cases, the laboratory uh, actually is a dangerous environment uh, for uh, human health, uh, for the environment, etc. And uh, I think uh, basically uh, we'll uh, we we'll do something to 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 make the to make the the, the the developing country to learn to to know how to design how to construct a laboratory. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Huang. Well, uh, we're. 
Approaching the end of our session, I have uh, one final question from the audience. So is the TSP 290 available for review and what will be the next steps? Available for, I, I did not catch your question, please. Is the TSP 290 available for review and what will be the next steps? So the, the next step, if it's created, uh, will be to uh, uh, to be uh, to, to 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 take into account the, the comments that will be made by the different countries concerning its scope. The first activity of a technical committee is really to to fix its scope in order to be sure that everybody agrees to to go in the same direction within this committee. And uh, afterwards, uh, the committee will have to uh, to have the first meeting. And during this first meeting, uh, priority here will be uh, decided, a business plan will be uh, created, and also the, the technical committee will have to, uh, to accept and to, to give uh, requirements on uh, uh, the structure of the committee, uh, how many standards do we need to write, how many standards do we already have around the table, and uh, do we need to create subcommittees or only working groups, and uh, and what are the needs of, of the participants. So really the first items are business plan and structure of the committee and uh, also what are the different items that we want uh, to standardize as the priority. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Catherine. We are with that approaching... Yeah, uh, one final thing from me. The, 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 there's, an, there's currently a ballot going that Deadline is 26th of September. So if people think this is a good idea, they should encourage their standards authority to vote before 26th. Not much time left, but. Thank you very much, Mr. Patel. Um, so you all heard it, a ballot is ongoing and you will be able to, you or your respective standards body will be able to vote for um, the TSP 290 before 26 of September. So indeed, there is not much time left. Um, and there is also unfortunately not much time left for our session. So we are approaching the end. I'd like to uh, say that all the related material, the presentations and also the recordings of this session will be made available to the audience. We got a lot of questions in this regard and unfortunately due to time constraints we had to skip some of the slides which i'm sure are very interesting for the audience so you will receive the material after um, the session having said that i'd like to thank one more time all our speakers and of course the audience i saw we were uh, more than 200 people participated in the session today which i think is a very good uh, outreach um, so thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much to all the participants. And uh, today we heard that life inside the laboratory is becoming more and more complex. We can only agree to that. Um, and for any further information on how UNIDO can support uh, the laboratory or the development of your quality infrastructure, please refer to our website, the UNIDO Knowledge Hub hub.unido.org. You'll also find the recordings of this session and other interesting material there. So having said that, I'd like to officially close this session with a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.